All right, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes for uh, December for uh, November 18th, where we're going to be hearing all about lessons from a cabbage field, what I learned in Lithuania. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have our speaker for up to about an hour. Then we're going to have our question and answer period where in that part we ask for questions because after the questions period will come our infamous rebuttal period and I'll set about a certain amount of time on based on a certain amount of rebuttals we have. Usually it's between three to five minutes or thereabouts. Um, after that, we'll have our speaker who gets the last word. We have to wrap things up by 8.45 because the restaurant closes at nine. My name's Tim, I'll be your, mod I'll be your uh, AV guy and moderator for the night. Our illustrious leader is Charlie Paydock. And uh, Charlie, if you wanna take it away, let's get started with the announcements. All right, welcome to meeting number 3,742 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, I will give an advertisement. We have two email groups, uh, one a Google group and the other one a meetup group. There's instructions on the center top of our main website. It takes only less than a minute to subscribe, send a blank email, or to sign up to meet up. And you'll get one or two uh, messages per week and upcoming topics, No little or no traffic. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming pro programs. I have a dozen programs. On November 25th, Aaron Tim Bolger will be talking about Ask the question, is Biden a puppet of Obama and have powerful forces? Do they have a secret plan for Obama to serve a third term? So that's November 25th. On December 2nd, with the concerning the upcoming primaries, uh, we've got a candidate for commissioner of the Water, Water Reclamation District, Sharon Waller. We'll be talking about water and ecology on December the 2nd. <laughs> on December the 9th, um, our own Andy Anderson will be returning and, and talk about what people can do for constructive change concerning the climate crisis. And he'll give us an updated news on other, other critical problems. On December the 16th, I will be giving a presentation on my solution to the climate crisis. <laughs> I've got a simple, simple three-step process to terraform the entire planet, to terraform the Earth, and it will be habitable afterwards. No problem. We'll have a real nice planet. Okay, on December 23rd and 30th, we're going to be taking a little break in conjunction with the holidays. And we'll be returning uh, on the schedule thus far on January 13th. Dr. Mike Krauss of the Center for Pluralism will be taking a look at the um, Palestinian Israeli situation. And then on the 27th, uh, Kathy Power, the activist. We'll be discussing disability accessibility in the city or lack thereof. All right, that's about it. Thank you, Tim. Take it away. Is there anybody else who's got announcements in the, in the peanut gallery? Anybody else who's got announcements? All right. This has got to be an event. This All right. has got to be an event. Okay. It's not an event. Get up there. All right, Kay's coming up to give an announcement. Hopefully it'll be an event that I can attend. Go ahead. 
uh, the, uh, the engineer Arjun Makajani has just written a new book called Exploring the Dangers of Tritium. And he is going to speak about that book at seven o'clock Chicago time um, on the 30th of November. And um, you can find the, the uh, link to his talk on exploring the book, Exploring the Dangers of Tritium uh, by emailing me. My email is janbudar1 at gmail.com. But more simple, uh, just email NEIS, Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS at NEIS.org. And if you send an email and ask for the link, you can get on the Zoom call the 30th of November. Is it, is it so on the is, website? I don't know whether it is or not. I'm sorry, I don't know. Because I have the Nuclear Energy Information Service website up now and can, take, can share it, but uh, hang on a second. We might be able to pull it up for you. All you got to do is go to NEIS. Just to be safe, just try to remember nice. NEIS at NEIS.org. Okay. Uh, you know, give them a give them a email and they'll send you the link to the program on exploring the dangers of tritium. Okay, Andy, you got an announcement too. Go ahead. Uh, Charlie made a brief announcement about my talk coming up uh, December 9th. And of course, Charlie's giving one on December 16th on the uh, planetary problems of climate change and what can be done. Uh, my talk on December 9th is going to be a summary of three groups of blacked out books, the medical industrial complex, the military industrial complex, and the media industrial complex. Because the talk will be unlike anything you've seen anywhere, because we're going to be talking about Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, how all of the platforms now are running programs to cancel people that try to tell the truth on critical issues, a wide range of issues. And for those of you that are aware of it, um, <clears throat> the book on censored news out of Sonoma State, uh, it comes out, it'll be uh, released December 5th this year. Sonoma State University puts out a book, a paperback, with the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. So we'll give them a, have hopefully we'll have an update on the latest out of Sonoma State if I can get that book in time and digest it. But that's what my brother and I do. We translate books into one page, like take 10 or 15 or 20 books and translate it into a, a page cliff notes like this for somebody that doesn't have time to read 20 books. A massive amount of information, real world facts, what's going on exists in books, but you can't find it on the internet anymore because the internet is being massively censored by the US government, CIA and other uh, in <clears throat> agencies, in other words. So uh, for those of you that want to um, have an interesting talk about find out, make a short list of things that are just unbelievable that they're blacked out and they're happening, come December 9th and we, we're more than happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Okay, Andy, well, you're up there. Andy, Go ahead, you have to furnish a copy of the new title and program description to Tim so I get it right away. Not next week or next month. If you change the title of the program and the subject matter, you have to notify us so that we have the correct program posted on the schedule. Please do so before you leave tonight. Thank you. Okay. Introduce our speaker, Andy. What is your name, sir? <laughs> we have a speaker named Paul tonight from the Lithuanian community, apparently, right? No. No? That's wrong, too. Well, <laughs> that's what kind of humor we have here. Anyway, this is the College of Complexes, and uh, I've just let our speaker come up and introduce himself and his background. You're up. Go ahead, sir. All right. I'll get you. Does this work? It works. You might want to. Okay, yeah, we got it. Can you hear this? Yes, we can. 
Okay, that's going to come up again later. All right. I just want to see if that would work. Okay. Um, anybody here speak Lithuanian? I will. Labas Cabanas. Labas. Labas Cabanas. Labas Vakaros, we would say this is good evening. Um, Dos Bidanya. Kaip Tal Sakasi. And how are you? How are you? If you're good, say Gare. I'm okay. So, Martin, this whole draft, there's a. I got the slides up now. Okay. He is. He did tell me that. My name is Strauss. I am not Lithuanian. Um, <laughs> I am uh, from Chicago, Illinois, originally. I went to Loyola University of Chicago. I now teach at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. But uh, I've had the opportunity to go to Lithuania numerous times over the past almost 10 years. Starting in 2014 was my first journey to Lithuania. That was followed by a couple other visits there. They kept inviting me back. I couldn't understand why that was, but I kept going back. I kept meeting more people, more interesting people, and learning more about the, the country and issues taking place there. And I do a lot of work in Detroit. I'm based outside of Detroit and Dearborn, Michigan. So I do a lot of research and work in Detroit. And there were a lot of things that were happening in Lithuania. Lithuania is a post-Soviet country, as we will discuss. And uh, that reminded me of issues that communities are facing in Detroit. So I got to meet more and more people, got interested in things that were happening in the community there. And then I applied for a Fulbright uh, U.S. Scholars Grant, which is a, just going to say this for all the government conspiracy people out there, is a U.S. State Department program that paid to go to Lithuania for four months uh, from January through April of this year, 2023. So this presentation kind of has two parts to it. I'll see how far I get with the one part. If anybody wants to keep going, I've got another part. But, um, Part of it is simply talking about certain things about Lithuania that I wanted to share that I became aware of while I was uh, visiting there that I thought people might be generally interested in terms of this country and its particular culture and politics and so on. And then I have some more material about the particular community that I got involved with in Kaunas, Lithuania. So Lessons from a Cabbage Field the, is the title of my talk what I learned in Lithuania and a little bit of music I just played you is from a opera, a community opera called The Cabbage Field. And that's the introduction to this community opera called The Cabbage Field. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about The Cabbage Field and what it means, but also this opera, The Cabbage Field that I, I was able to be a part of in the time that I was there. So this is my signal, Charles. Okay, so I made an outline. Okay, it is. I made an outline, and this was in part for you, members of the audience, and in part for me, to make sure that I stayed on track and tried to hit on certain themes. Now, I actually don't know if I will hit on all these themes, but provided it as kind of a checklist for you if you want to come back in the rebuttal period or in the question and answer and follow up on some of these items in the outline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the shadows of history. First part, thinking about uh, the nation of Lithuania as a post-Soviet country. I was there in January through March, as I said, and this is not too long after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So that's an issue that hangs over the entire region. So we'll talk about the shadows of history, trauma, freedom, and authoritarianism. Talk a little bit about the cultivation of community and civil society in post-Soviet countries. I've got- Nature and sense of place. Nature and a sense of place is the last category I'm gonna to touch on. And there are some other kind of concepts loaded in there. Again, we get to all of them. Fine, if we don't, that's also fine. Are oh, you gonna put that there for me? Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. So this was just a little map as I show you, that's the country of Lithuania. That's the Baltic Sea there on the left. 
It's to the north of Poland, uh, Belarus, and Russia are to the east, and to the north are Latvia, Estonia, and um, above that, Finland. So this is in the, the Baltic region, Northern Europe, right? And right. Konis is the red where the heart is. That's the city where I spent uh, most of my time. It's the second largest city in Lithuania, and it's the home of several universities. So I was based at one of the universities in Konis, Lithuania. So most of what I'm talking about is going to be focused on Konis, Lithuania. Okay. So I wanted to offer a kind of a metaphor uh, for the process of going to a country like Lithuania or any country, I suppose, especially when you're going in January and the days are about six hours long and it gets dark at about four o'clock and it's cold and gray and, and uh, all alone by myself, my family who's here tonight wasn't with me. So um, the cold plunge is a practice that I learned while I was in Lithuania. This is one of my friends that I made in Konis. His name is Donatis. He's a very multi-talented individual. He's a singer, rapper, uh, performer. He does MC, he MCs for weddings is one of the things that he does. And he has this practice he does of, of the cold plunge where all through the winter time, he goes at least a few days a week and finds a nice cold body of water and immerses himself for about one to two minutes uh, and does like a, a breathing exercise there. It's intended to uh, build brown fat and as a health exercise. Right? And he introduced me to the process of the cold plunge. I have a full video of it, which I'm not gonna inflict on you. But this, this process of sort of getting used to the cold and like learning how to um, acclimate oneself to the temperature, to breathe through it, and to um, emerge from it somehow altered, but still, you know, maintaining oneself. To me, it seemed like a good kind of analogy for the process of trying to immerse oneself into another culture, one that is similar in some ways, but also very different you know, from our American culture. So off to the cold climb. So this is when I first arrived in Conus. Uh, this is a, um, a mural, a pink elephant. It's kind of iconic in the city of Conus, which was also home to the Fluxus art movement. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Fluxus art movement, movement of radical artists, actually a, kind of a global movement, but some of its founding figures were from Lithuania and a couple of them were based in Conus. So that was when I first arrived in January. And one of the first things that I noticed, of course, was, um, and the, I did, uh, so I, I also have a lot of drawings interspersed in here because one of the things I did in the time period when I was there is I do a daily drawings. So a lot of the drawings I did were reflective of things I was seeing, trying to understand or observing in colonists and in Lithuania. And one of the first things I noticed was how many um, Ukrainian flags were there, uh, as well as Lithuanian flags. So that's the Lithuanian flag on the right, and it's the Ukrainian flag on the left. This is actually flying in the window of a former synagogue in uh, Konis. I'll talk more about the history of Konis as it relates to the Jewish population in a little bit, but the support for Ukraine was very, very strong and unanimous and, and, and for the most part didn't need to be stated. When I did talk to people about it, um, they had they had no hesitation in terms of, in fact, some of the friends that I talked to about uh, the, the U.S. support for Ukraine we're worried that U.S. support would not last and that um, U.S. support was actually not strong enough because this has to do, of course, with the history of Lithuania in relationship to uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. And for them, they saw the prospect of uh, occupation by Russia and um, potential re, you know, um, taking of the Baltic states to be something much, much worse than anything that could happen as a result of um, even nuclear weapons. So some people I talked to said, well, even if there are nuclear weapons, we'd rather die. <laughs> so if, if, if Putin does use nuclear weapons and he kills us, we would rather die than have to live under uh, Russian domination again. So. so that's uh, just one example of how history hangs over um, this, this uh, entire region, this entire country. So this is another plunge. Uh, this is a swimming pool where I would go a couple days a week with an acquaintance in Connors, Lithuania and do lap swims a couple days a week. It's in a uh, elementary and high school, which has an athletic focus. So they had a very nice pool, 50 meter pool. We go in there, do our laps and we come out. 
and this is the um, so in the courtyard of this uh, building where we would do our swim, and there was uh, a marker, a monument, and you wouldn't even notice it if all you were doing was if, like a lot of the kids that were there for school would come out of the school and they would, you know, they would be, you know, their school kids would be, you know, uh, on their way somewhere else. They go right past this little, this little monument that was there, this little marble monument. And I had learned about this event in the history of Conus called the Batuka's Garage Massacre, which involved um, Lithuanian nationals in the early part of the uh, Nazi occupation of Lithuania, killing uh, local Jewish people by hand with clubs uh, in the this garage, the Latukas garage. And so I asked my friend Ed, who was my swim partner, said, do you know about uh, this Latukas garage? He said, oh yeah, it's right there in the same place where we go to swim. Right, so if you go to the next slide, I think I have illustration of this is you know some of the stones that have been left by people visiting the monument, um, commemorating uh, the lives lost there. And this is the monument itself, as you can see. That little small photo shows you the, the monument in the foreground there. In the background is actually like an outdoor volleyball store outside of the school. So I um, mean, it's it's this. Uh, go one more slide. This is this is the outside of the school, right? As it looks today, if you go to the next slide, uh, this should be a scene from the Latukas Garage massacre. Uh, you can see there were several hundred people that were killed. Actually, their bodies were piled up in this very same space where today is this courtyard outside of this uh, school. And I think there's one more image, maybe depending on which version. This is. Oh, so this was a guy that. Uh, Came to be nicknamed the Death Dealer of Konis, of Kovno, which was the name that the Russian name for Konis. Uh, his identity is supposedly unknown, although a lot of people have, have done detective work to figure out what happened to him and where he went. He was a very, you know, he was photographed, as you can see. There were people that were there photographing this event, and he seemed to be very proud of what he was doing. He was not a not. These were not. These were not German national. These were not German Nazi soldiers. These were Lithuanian nationals who, for a variety of reasons, were actually um, supportive of what the Nazis were starting to do. And this was in the early part of the, um, the show of the Holocaust. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that first because I think it's an example of how in this country, it's a small country, it's only 3 million people. The size of Lithuania is probably smaller than the state of Michigan where we live, which has a population of 9 million people. But how history hangs over the shadow of history hangs over everything, and so every every place, every every corner. Uh, this is a, a courtyard, uh, which is an occupied courtyard. It also is the site of this courtyard gallery. And an image I showed earlier was an image of a of a Jewish individual that would have lived there prior to World War II, right? And what happened, of course. Is that the population of Konis, the Jewish population of Konis, which was about 40% of the population, was almost entirely uh, wiped out during the process of the German occupation. In fact, there was a large concentration camp outside of Konis. So these memories, though, are, are inscribed in different places. If you didn't know, if you didn't know where to look for, you might not even notice because, of course, daily life goes on in the city. This is another thing uh, that I wanted to mention to people because especially being back here in Chicago, um, how many of you ever heard of a guy named uh, Valdis Adamkus? This is, this is me and Valdis Adamkus. He's still alive actually, but this is uh, in, in his earlier years. Uh, Valdis Adamkus was uh, the first president of the free Lithuania after Lithuania became independent following, or maybe he was the second president. Uh, after the Soviet, after they broke away from the Soviet Union in 1991. But we should know who Valdis Adamkus is, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because um, if you show the next slide, Tim. I got it. So Valdis Adamkus was a uh, refugee. He was, along with many, many others who fled Lithuania, so many people were killed um, during the 
German occupation during the Nazi period, many Jews were killed, many others fled. So many Jewish Lithuanians left Lithuania, of course. Uh, many, some went to Israel, some went to the US, many other countries. After World War II, when the Soviets came in, many more Lithuanians left because their lives were now at risk, especially if they were educated, if they were, uh, if they were had any, uh, they were middle class or considered bourgeois or, um, there are many different classes of people who would be susceptible to either being killed or being sent to prison camps in Siberia and so on. So many people left. Uh, Valdas Adamkus and his family, that's actually a shortened version of his name. That was kind of Americanized his name, Devon Sadamkus. You can imagine. Lithuanian names can be very, very long. I'll give you a few examples later on. Uh, so he was part of this wave of Lithuanian emigres that came to the United States. Of course, Chicago was a major destination for Lithuanians, uh, as it had been in earlier waves of emigration from Lithuania. Uh, these, this is actually a photo taken in Massachusetts, which is a large community of Lithuanians there. It was in the Adamkus Museum. So back up. I'm going to get to that. Here. Sorry about that. That's okay. So this is Val Adamkus, because he would also go by Val. This is Chicago, right? So he's not going to go by Val. It's in Val. Val, Val Adamkus. He ran for um, a uh, position of uh, sanitary district trustee in the year, I think it was 1968, right? Which I saw that, so this was in the Adam, so there, he was the president of Lithuania, one of the first presidents of the newly free Lithuania. So he has a presidential museum. It's not yeah. Lithuanian yeah. president, yeah. but it was a practice yeah. that was started. Actually, is to imitate what we do in the United States, where we give our former president's presidential museum. So he does have a presidential museum there. And there was this exhibit about his career that I went to go see. I found it really fascinating because I've never heard of Valdis Adamkus, right? And he had run for sanitary district. He was a Republican. Uh, guess what happened? In Chicago, in the city of Chicago, in the uh, north side. He lost, right? He didn't win. <laughs> but he ran on this... Uh, this, this sort of new idea at the time, I think his wife had suggested to him. His wife, by the way, they're still married. They're in their 90s now. Yes. Um, she said, well, you know, a lot of people now are talking about the environment and the earth. People are caring about that. You should run on something related to the environmental, to taking care of the environment. So he did, right? So you can see his campaign slogan is, you breathe a lot easier with the Domkus, right? This is his campaign poster. He lost. But this is 1968, so we go to the next one. He lost, but um, Richard Nixon won. And Richard Nixon also, those of you, people in this room, I'm sure remember that Richard Nixon, if he were president today, of course, would be, um, he would be far more liberal than our current president, probably. <laughs> if you just go based on his policies, because Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency in the early 1970s. And when he created the Environmental Protection Agency and also the Clean Air Act was passed and the Clean Water Act was passed, he needed a director. And so they had this young, like, uh, Adamkus was trained as an engineer, I believe, this young, um, shiny, competent engineer type uh, from Chicago. They plucked him to be uh, a part of the new EPA, right? Because he's a Republican. He was talking about this environmental stuff. They didn't know anything about it. So we're like, what's this guy? So he, he kind of works his way up to the EPA. He eventually becomes the director of District 5, those you, Region 5, sorry, which is where we are, of course, Region 5, the Environmental Protection Agency. And he's a director, uh, regional director for many years. He actually becomes one of the most revered directors of, of the EPA. Um, I love this when I saw this in the museum there because my brother and I, my brother's right there, we used to deliver papers, right? And my sister. Do we maybe we draft you? And, yeah. So we delivered, and we had a few sometimes, it was mainly trips, mainly trips, right? This was, a, I think this is a trip. And you know, you know, in newspapers, you say you've got the above the fold story and the below the fold story. So I love this because in Lithuania, they had this story feature, they had it in frame, right? And they were focusing on the below the line story, which is about how Val Adamkus is leading this effort to uh, prosecute Dow Chemical for uh, dumping, uh, uh, dumping uh, contaminants, I believe, into the Great Lakes, right? And it was actually, it was not something that was easy to do at the time, certainly for a Republican, but he actually stuck to his guns and he actually was able to, uh, in a sense, beat Dow Chemical. And this was a kind of a big story of him testifying against Dow Chemical. Um, but the thing I noticed about this is, of course, the above the fold story is the one that I remember, because I don't remember anything about this. But I do remember, 
uh, the murder of John Belushi or John Belushi's death, because that was like the big story in Chicago. Remember, John Belushi died suddenly at a young age. And it's like, what happened to John Belushi? It's an overdose, and these women did it. So this is all we were paying attention to. Meanwhile, this really important story. So Valdis Adamkis was a guy who worked as who came to the U.S. from Lithuania, became part of our society, our political system, became a part of the government, and. One of the things that really struck me about his stories, this will be one of my lessons, is right, is that um, in listening to the account of his life, was that, you know, like I said, he was he was a Republican. He was not really ideological, but he believed that government, if you're in government, you should actually be trying to do things, you know, um, to make things better. And he was appointed as director of the Environmental Protection Agency. So he felt like part of our job, the Environmental Protection Agency, is actually to clean up the environment and to prosecute polluters. And so from that standpoint, he he did what his job was. So to me, it was actually kind of an example of, you know, we, we, we uh, complain about bureaucrats a lot, you know, how, how much we hate bureaucracy, but how, uh, you, know, you know, bureaucrats can be heroes too. I mean, people that do their job and do fulfill their mission, especially if they're in public service. Um, he was actually a, kind of a great example of that. Now, again, he's little known to us here, even in his sort of adopted hometown of Chicago, but he went back to Lithuania he was elected president two times. He was elected president once, and then he he stepped down, and then they had another president that got into some controversy, I think, some corruption controversy. They ended up electing Adamkus again. He's still today one of the most popular presidents uh, in uh, post-World uh, War II Lithuania. So to me, that was actually a, a really important story, something I took away. In terms of our own you know, entanglement with other nations that sometimes we don't even understand, right? I just I just advanced the one. You want me to go back? No, no, that's fine. So uh, January is when I arrived. Uh, actually, January second. I think I left January first. I got there January second. And one of the first holidays that I, I experienced there was January thirteenth, which is officially known as uh, the Day of the Freedom Defenders. And this is celebrating an incident that happened. I believe you can you can read it there. I don't think I read it. in the early nineteen nineties where. Um, Lithuanian people, uh, after they declared themselves independent from the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev was the, you know, the premier of the Soviet Union during the, um, what was that era called? Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost and Perestroika, right? So we remember him as the guy that helped to, um, that presided over the fall of the Soviet Union. Of course, he didn't intend to do that. He wanted to hold the Soviet Union together. And he wanted to keep Lithuania. And so when Lithuania declared independence, they sent tanks. They did things they had done in other places. And they were they encountered resistance. It was mainly nonviolent, uh, unarmed resistance. And in fact, entirely because the Lithuanians didn't have any means to counter the military might of the Soviet Union. And so this incident on January 13th was where you had unarmed civilians confronting these tanks in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, in this, in this kind of uh, diplomatic encounter and uh, they won, right? Eventually the tanks were withdrawn and, and Lithuania maintained its independence. Uh, those of you who remember, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia were known in this period for enacting a mostly bloodless kind of revolution against the Soviet Union. It's known as the Singing Revolution. Does anybody remember the Singing Revolution? Yeah. Where they actually held hands across all three countries and they sang. Going back to my opera story, where you back to that. Um, and, um, it's, you know, it's funny when I talk to my students today, nobody knows anything about any of this, right? They don't even know about the solidarity movement in Poland, much oh. less about the singing revolution Ooh. in, um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Baltic states. But it's really an amazing thing. And if you think about it, January 13th is also around the time we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. So when I was there, you know, earlier this year and uh, thinking about these stories and how like, you know, Dr. King's influence actually extremely important all over the world. I mean, these are people that were motivated by the same desire to stand up for their own freedom against an oppressive <laughs> state, right? And so this is recognized, this is a state holiday in Lithuania. Go ahead. Um, it's not the Independence Day. This is where it can get confusing. Oh, I just want to show one example of a Soviet statue. A lot of the Soviet statues have been removed in um, Lithuania, as in many of the other post-Soviet countries, uh, some of them are still there. And usually if they're still there, it's because they don't have like an overtly sort of like they're not a statue of Lenin or a statue of Marx or, or some other sort of propped up, you know, hero that they created a lot. So we do need to create sort of local heroes out of 
people had made put statues of them. Um, this was uh, this one I think is called like uh, a statue of the great motherland or something like that. So this one is still there, but um, most of them aren't. But there you still you, again, it's an example of how you see these these sort of signs and these shadows of this history are still a, a part of everyday life. Um, in a way, I think about you know we talk a lot about you know freedom here. Of course, we had a revolution in this country you know at one point, but I mean when people talk about it there, what their freedom from what? I mean it's it's very much a direct memory for a lot of people in terms of what it is that um, it means to, to not have that freedom. So, oh, this is also an American story that has an American parallel and American connection. Um, these were two uh, men, they weren't brothers, although sometimes they're always pictured together. So you might think that they're brothers. Their names were um, uh, uh, Darius and Garenus. Those were actually, I think, their, uh, their first names. They were Lithuanian American, and they were pilots. And they they uh, went on this during the period of Lithuanian independence, the first Lithuanian independence. So Lithuania lived under the domination of the Russian Empire for many years, and they became free after the world after the First World War. When what all what happened? Do you guys remember history students? Well, there was a revolution in in Russia, right? in 1917, 1918. So the Russian empire collapsed from the inside and that enabled a number of countries, Poland was another one, to become independent and free um, in the early part of the 20th century. So this was known as the sort of the period of the first uh, or the reestablishment of Lithuanian independence. And it was kind of a golden era. Konis was the capital at that time because Vilnius was still controlled by Poland. And um, there was a lot of sort of like fervent nationalism in Lithuania about in, during this period. Um, and Darius and Gorinus were these pilots. They were Lithuanian origin. They grew up, I think, partly in the US, partly in Lithuania. And they decided to do this like Lindbergh style flight over the Atlantic from the US to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. And they made it almost. They made it almost all the way there. I think they were about a thousand kilometers uh, from. Vilnius or Kaunas, which was the capital at the time, because Vilnius was part of Poland. So they were headed to Kaunas and they crashed and they both died. Um, now, I sometimes tell people this is this is actually kind of like a really Lithuanian version of Wilbur and Orville Wright, because of course, Wilbur and Orville Wright, we I used to live in Dayton, Ohio, where they're they're held up as big heroes. <laughs> And of course, American stories are supposed to have happy endings, right? Wilbur and Orville, they invented the airplane and they got to be really, really rich, right? And happy forever after. The heroes here, you know, die at the end. And there is this kind of tragic, and it's, but in a way, this is very, very kind of Lithuanian. And my, my, my Polish scholar friend would say there's a similarity with Polish culture too. There's this kind of tragic sensibility because, because of this experience of so much trauma, you know, when uh, independence then followed by, you know, um, another period of uh, domination and so on. And so these, these monuments, to, this is the actual grave of Darius and Grainus, which is in Conus. Um, but there are monuments to them everywhere. There are schools named after them, things named after them everywhere. And if you didn't know anything and you were in Lithuania, but who are these guys? Why, why are these names everywhere? And that's, they were these kind of tragic uh, figures. I was gonna uh, share something else. I'm gonna pass it around. The right there is a, uh, Carl, if you can pass it around. This is a uh, Lithuanian statue of Jesus. And to me, it's just a very typically kind of Lithuanian um, rendition of Jesus as this sort of very morose, sad figure. Uh, not, not this sort of triumphant um, figure, but a kind of a tragic, sad figure. Um, anyway, so I wanted to mention Darius and Grainus because I think this is, again, an example of how this history is very much a part of daily life, but also part of the identity of how Lithuanians conceive of themselves and their role in history. Okay. Lithuania has two, or actually possibly, I think as many as three independence days. <laughs> and this has to do with this history uh, but the third one is sort of like the made up one. Well, so the first two have to do with that first, that period of independence when Darius and Gorinus, the 1920s, when Lithuania became independent from Russian empire. The second one is a sort of restitution of independence after the fall of the Soviet Union. 
So they, they, they celebrate them both. And they have a third one, which is supposed to honor the foundation of the Lithuanian state and, and has to do with King August, just like a medieval king. But you know, that wasn't really, that, nation states didn't really exist at the time. And whatever Mindagos thought of in terms of Lithuania is not the same thing as what exists today. But nonetheless, they, they decided they needed to have uh, an Independence Day in the summer so they could barbecue like Americans do. So they created a third one. But um, so I was there for, um, so if you just go back, I'm sorry. Real fast. That's okay. These are some photos I took in Conus uh, during the uh, Independence Day um, in February. And you can see, you know, people people come out, uh, you know, the uniforms come out, but the people come out too with the Lithuanian flags. This was a young boy with his uh, uniform on, but you can see in the background that orange light, that's the that's the eternal flame in the um, in the plaza in Kaunas, which is always burning, representing the, the you know, you know, uh, Lithuanian uh, freedom and independence, and the, and the sort of long struggle for it, and so how much it's, it's valued as a result of that. Okay, now you can go ahead. So this is just a drawing I did of you know a quick sketch of you know one of the leftover scenes from that day. You see one of the statues there of a of a um, Lithuanian patriot. I'm, I can't remember actually which one this is, and then you know a. a, a kid there with the uh, balloons in the Lithuanian colors. So people really come out. This is really a part of like uh, an animate that animates uh, daily life. Go ahead. And uh, how I spent the Independence Day in February, this was really great. I had the opportunity to participate in a uh, Independence Day kayak trip down the Nemanos River in February. So you can imagine that was uh, actually it wasn't too cold that day. So it was cold, but it wasn't it wasn't deadly cold. I did not fall in, no. Uh, the route was uh, I don't know, I remember it's like ten kilometers, six something like that, and it was a long looping route. And this is at the end, and we ended up in the old town in Conus. You see, if you wore any Lithuanian colors that day, you got uh, you got the fee wave. So I had some Lithuanian colored gloves. You can see that's me on the left. So. It's like where's Waldo? You have to see where I am in all these pictures. Okay, so and then these are some pictures. I was taking photos from the water as well. You can see the spirit of Lithuanian flags on the on the boats there, paddling down the Nominus River. And these are some sketches I did later. Those are the um, those are uh, cooches, I think. That was coots, cooches. Sorry, that sounds. <laughs> Coots. There were the coots watching from the banks, and that was uh, one of the one of the one of the boats on the river. Of course, you see there also. I mean, this is also an industrial landscape in some places because during, especially during the Soviet period, uh, the Nemanos River was dammed by the Soviets, so they created this big reservoir, re-altered the the, um, the course of the river and swell it in some areas, and drowned actually a number of villages. I mean, they they evacuated them first, but. Um, but again, that, that sort of that, that Soviet period is still very much a part of life and it had a, a, a detrimental impact on the environment too. So if you think about that legacy of uh, Adamkus, when he came back to Lithuania, I think for the first time was before the fall of the Soviet Union, he actually started doing work with EPA in Lithuania to establish the level of contaminants in the Nominus River, which is the longest river in Lithuania that runs through uh, Kaunas. Oh. This is another story that I became aware of. Again, I would have known any of this stuff probably. My, my son knew about Rose Nama Yunus. Does anybody here know who Rose Yama, Nama Yunus is? Well, you do, right? That's my daughter. Yeah. Mike, did you know Rose Nama Yunus? What do you know about Rose? Yeah, she was known, she's known as Thug Rose is the name she's been given in MMA. She's small. She's, I think she weighs like, what, 110 or something like that? Really, really, she came. She she was a daughter of uh, Lithuanian refugees in the post-Soviet period. They came in a very, very one of the very early waves of people coming to the U.S. They settled in Milwaukee, and that's where mostly where she was raised. Uh, so she became very, very prominent in, in MMA circles. She's she's pretty well known. That's why my son knows her because I mean he doesn't know her personally. He her. But she's like a hero uh, there, and she actually has family from Kaunas. So the the film. Which was only a, it was like a probably a film you would see on ESPN or something here I think because I think it was made by the uh, one of one of the one of the fight organizations they made the film the director by the way was the same director that made the film about the Lithuanian basketball team do you all know about the Lithuanian basketball team from the 
from the early 1990s. They wore tie-dye jerseys, Arvidas Sarbonas played on that basketball team. And um, they were sort of a legendary team. They were the first uh, you know, independence team. They did pretty well in the Olympics. But they, again, they represented a sort of spirit of freedom and liberation. So if I could just sum up Lithuania, and maybe this would save me a lot of time. One woman at, at the university where I was based, she, we did this uh, sort of meeting of all of these people that were coming to Lithuania from different places. And they were asking all of us, well, what are the three things you think of when you think of Lithuania? And uh, we all went around and we said things that we think of. And she as a Lithuanian said, well, if you ask me the three things I think of that makes Lithuania distinctive, there are three things. One is uh, language. The Lithuanian language is very kind of unique and distinctive and very difficult to learn. But they're very, very proud of this language because they fought to keep this language alive. And so the Russians tried to crush the language and so on. Second one was nature. And I'll talk more about the role of nature within my outline, I think, and how important nature is in sort of daily life and, and what it means to people. And the third one, basketball. So uh, wow. nature, language, language, nature, and basketball. So this is a drawing I did of one of the Rose posters that was on one of the bus uh, stations. They were kind of all over town. So she actually came to visit Kaunas. She went to go see the basketball team too. And she went to see them at halftime. There was this really great video of her giving this sort of uh, pep talk to the, to the um, Zalgiris basketball team, which is the, um, the team in, in Kaunas, which is a pretty popular team. They play, they play actually in the European Champions League. They play against Madrid and Barcelona, I mean Barcelona and Bayern Munich and a lot of the big European teams. And they're, you know, they have, they're a small team compared, but they actually do fairly well. They have a lot of Americans that play for the team, mostly African Americans. It wouldn't surprise you probably. But so here's this row, little rose is going to this room, all these these big basketball players and giving this uh, inspiring speech. It's pretty great. Anyway. So um, I had the opportunity while I was there to visit a lot of different sites, a lot of different neighborhood sites. One of the things you find, again, this history is woven through the, the fabric of every community. Uh, there's actually a system of fortresses that exists in Collins, Lithuania that have become a part of these different neighborhoods. And so this is, uh, I'm going along with a group of people visiting one of these abandoned bunkers. So these bunkers are still there. In some cases, they're not being used. In other cases, they've been put to a lot of other uses. I saw a concert in a bunker. Uh, which was a group from Ukraine, actually, that had come to raise money to bring back, you know, to bring back to Ukraine. They started a candle factory in uh, one of these old bunkers to, to create these candles that they could also send to Ukraine so people could have a source of light um, to get them through, you know, especially in that first winter. They, so people in, you have a lot of people in Lithuania that were really doing a lot to try, as uh, volunteers, as donors, and so on, to support uh, their uh, brethren in, in Ukraine. So again, these uh, bunkers were a, a part of different communities that became incorporated in the daily life of those communities. That actually gets us to the story of the cabbage field thing. Oh, there's a drawing I did showing kind of nature and basketball together. I always <laughs> thought, you find the basketball hoops are like all over the place. And I always love seeing them like right in the middle of the forest in different places, you know, and people would just build basketball hoops like out of anything. This was, you know, more or less a regular basketball hoop, but it was, you know, in this, right outside actually where that fortress was. That's where this basketball hoop was. Um, there wasn't anybody playing at the time, but it's so much a part of daily life. So. Uh, one of the things in my notes, I think in my outline was, you can go go ahead, Jim, just keep me moving along. Uh, this is actually one of the photographs that I didn't take. I stole this one off the internet, so don't tell anybody that it's here. This, because I didn't go to the Hill of Crosses. Hill of Crosses is one of these very famous sites in Lithuania. Pope John Paul went there when he went on his tour of the, of the um, of, of Lithuania. Um, it's really a remarkable site, even though I haven't been there. You know, I've, I've read about and the story of it is, of course, Lithuanians are very fervent Catholics, deep Catholics as well. Um, they would raise these crosses. They were in honor, I think, of, of people that had been lost during this period of Soviet occupation. And the Soviets would come and knock these crosses down and try to burn them, they come back the next day and they people put more crosses up, you know? So it was this thing where people would keep putting up the more crosses and it became, of course, again, a representation of this resistance, of this resistance and of this, this survival of this identity, this Lithuanian identity. But I did want to point out this thing about Lithuanian crosses. Another important thing to know, and this gets to the role of nature as well, and then we'll get into the cabbage field. Um, Lithuania was the last country in Europe to convert 
to Christianity from paganism. The 15th or 16th century, they were the last Europeans to convert to Christianity. And so the, um, the, 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 the sort of veneer of Catholicism <laughs> over the, the paganism is very, very thin in some cases. And I think if you look at, at Lithuanian crosses, which again, this is a sort of resistance of Lithuanian Catholicism, but also if you look at the way these crosses are made and uh, the iconography of these crosses, it, it very much closely resembles um, pagan iconography. So these are some photos I did take. So, and this is a, a, a Lithuanian cross, which uh, represents uh, um, the light of Christ in the swamp. So I, I like swamps too. So I went to a lot of swamps when I was there. I don't have a whole swamp segment. But. And then this is a forest, uh, um, Punis Pilis, which is one of the old ancient forests in Lithuania. There are a few remaining ancient like old growth forests. I went to go, I was able to go see this one. And again, you can sort of, and there are a lot of this, this wooden statuary, like you can see with the, with the Jesus figure, is very uh, representative of Lithuanian kind of art and culture, this, this, this working in wood and these wooden forms. And you can, I think you can see the sort of resemblance how the, the Christian, the, the pre-Christian traditions were carried over into the, um, uh, into the, the um, practice of Catholicism. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. What's your thing? Anybody need a bath? All right, we go. Go ahead. Okay, so now my journey can begin. It's all prologue. <laughs> no, so I'm going to talk about the neighborhood of Shanxi because this is uh, this. Yeah, I'm talking about the Lithuanian language, right? So this word here is the name of a neighborhood in Kaunas, and it's pronounced Shanxi. And this is a site in Shanxi, which I learned later is called the Cabbage Field. It's actually, it looks, you know, this is, again, this is one of the reasons I got really interested in this place, because it looks like a lot of places in Detroit, right? You know, we have a lot of places that look like this. Uh, crumbling buildings with graffiti on them, you know, where people have marked them and occupied them in different ways. And I became aware of this site and how people in this community of Shanxi were actually trying to reanimate the site and, and to bring it back into public use and to give it sort of new meaning, but also connecting it to the heart of the community. And as my colleague, uh, Yorate Imbrasite, I think I got that right. Yorate was the first one that took me to Shanxi. Uh, and she's the one who actually took this photograph. So it should say photograph by Yorate Imbrasite. So, so my, my journey with Shanxi starts here. And then it, it takes me here. This is, this is the photograph from June. I actually went back. I was able to go back in June to present a paper with Ed and Vita. They're married. Ed is actually Irish. Um, but he fell in love with a Lithuanian. This was actually not an uncommon story. People would, you know, meet a Lithuanian. Usually it was meeting a Lithuanian woman and then ending up in Lithuania. I actually met a guy from Michigan that way, Joe Tobin. It's like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, my wife's Lithuanian. Here I am. <laughs> He's from Gross Steel. You can imagine that. Frankie, you know what that means. Okay. So um, now go back to a second. So I was telling you about the um, the river where I where I kayak i think so this was this is it so this is like um the old town is down here so we started like way up there and we went all around and this this sort of bubble or this sort of teardrop as ed calls it shape is the shanxi community so it's it's inside of conus but it's sort of surrounded by water on three sides it has this kind of distinctive identity because they're also the site of these fortresses it was the site of um armories and barracks during the Tsarist period but then again during the soviet period and even after that. So in some ways it was gated off from other parts of Conus. And so it had this kind of distinctive identity. There were also a lot of factories and things there. So it was a working class community, but also surrounded by nature on the other hand. So Chanchi is this place where there's both the relationship to nature that I mentioned and the history, the shadow of history are both like a, a part of the daily fabric of life. And Ed and, and, and Vita are these uh, artists, but the art they do is, is really the art of, of, of creating and fostering community. <clears throat> okay, now you can go ahead. I think so. This is a photograph. I think I have the credit here. Darius Petrulis, who's a great uh, colonist based photographer, took a lot of the photographs for the Shanxi Neighborhood uh, Association. This is a photograph of an event taking place on the grounds of this place called the Cabbage Field, uh, which in my first slide, I had an image of it. Um, these, these three sort of um, 
brick like cellars covered with earth and they were places the reason why they call it the cabbage field is because then they did research on the history of this purpose of this uh, part of the fortress system it was a place where they used to store sauerkraut right um, and so they would um, harvest cabbage convert cabbage into sauerkraut and keep it there so it was, they called the area around the source this sort of sauerkraut store and sauerkraut was of course is an incredibly important food because it can be stored uh, and it's it's rich in <clears throat> lots of of vitamin C and other minerals that help keep people you know, healthy during cold, long, cold winters and so on. So this place had this sort of historical uh, meaning, but it had been lost. It was that people were just in the period of transition from the Soviet period to the... The other thing I should mention is think about the Rose story. Rose was this young woman who grew up in the 1990s, basically in M Milwaukee. And I was, you know, I was working here in Chicago during the 1990s. 1990s was really, what do you guys remember about the 1990s? Hmm. What? The rise of the internet. Okay, all right. And, and the, the, uh, what, the information superhighway. No, Bill Clinton used to call I remember Bill Clinton, correct. that's what I remember. And also, uh, Lithuania was one of the first governments to go online completely. Yeah, yeah, well, they didn't have anything to lose. Why not? <laughs> no. Um, it's funny because I started thinking about the 1990s and sort of my relationship to the 1990s too, because the 1990s in this in this region, right, was this time of incredible hope and optimism because yeah. you had the fall of the Soviet Union. It was also a really, really difficult time because this transition to kind of sort of free market economics was not easy. It was very, very tough. So there was a lot of issues with uh, violence, um, gang, nothing compared to what we have here, right? So <laughs> this is what I remember. The 1990s here were also pretty rough. I, mean, I think we, it's popular remembered in terms of politics as being, uh, you know, a period of economic prosperity and Clinton balanced the budget and everything. Uh, but um, Beavis and Butthead. The, the, uh, the, okay, the, we'll get to the rebuttal period. Later. <laughs> the, uh, the economy was growing and all that stuff. stuff. But what I remember, because I was working in Steve Chicago, my friend Chris over there, we both worked tuberculosis control in Steve Chicago. Tuberculosis was uh, an epidemic in the United States in the 1990s. It was because we had disinvested from our inner, from our poor populations in inner cities. And um, New York City, Chicago, many other cities saw this resurgence of tuberculosis. You also had uh, crack cocaine is a horrible problem, HIV AIDS, horrible problems. You had a lot of violence. A lot of people went to prison. The prison system grew in the 1990s, right? Exponentially, right? So now we have 2 million some people in prison, you know, before the 80s, you know, we, or the prison system was a fraction of that size. So, you know, all these things are going on here. And then uh, start seeing, so this period of the, the cabbage field was this place that during the 1990s, people started coming in because it was this rough period in colonists, this transition. People were trying to stay, you know, uh, make a living, right? Because they didn't, they had jobs in the Soviet system, but they didn't have jobs yet. They hadn't created an economy yet, so people were scavenging things. This is like what happens in Detroit. People go and scavenge from old buildings. They get materials out of there, stuff they can sell. They were taking the bricks. They were selling the bricks. They were taking anything they could take. So it became kind of this ravaged area, it became this sort of blighted area, and people didn't remember what it meant, right? So when Ed and Vida and the other group of artists sort of started looking at this place in the history of it, they're like, well, this is right here in the middle of our community. It's sort of like this green space. It has this historical value. We should do something here and make it into like a community art you know, place. So they started doing these these events there. And what came out of this was the development uh, over time of this idea for a community opera called uh, the Cabbage Field. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, the one thing, other thing I'll mention about Ed and Vida are also incredible fighters, uh, Vida especially. So I was going to talk about women in Lithuania are just powerful. <laughs> Everywhere I went, it's like, it seemed that when I, when I wanted to see something that was happening, like something that was being done, people were like getting things done. It was and at the university too. Like all the people, I go to a meeting at the university. It's like, well, you're going to meet with all these department heads. I was like the one guy in the room, right? It was all these like powerful women, you know, like these Lithuanian women, you know, and like, and like the community organizations, it's like that too. They're like, oh yeah, we have a problem with the government. What we do, well, this is what you do. Because I heard this in Poland too. Get a bunch of the women in the community to go down there Right. And they'll, they'll cook up a bunch of food. They'll get a bunch of people to go out. They're going to go march on that politician's house and they're going to get them to change their mind. And that's how you get stuff like kind of done in the system. Right. So Vida was like one of these people. It's like she had like she would go like, you know, like with a list, you know, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to fight this, this city government, because they had this issue where the city government wanted to come and they want to develop Chanchi. Because, you know, what happens when you have a city that's 
you know, the colonists had lost population. It was kind of starting to grow again, but it went, you know, it went through these rough periods. But um, you had this mayor that wanted, it was very pro-development, you know. And he was like building roads everywhere. It was like he was like the president, like the, the mayor of asphalt, you know. He's thinking, you know uh -huh. People like a lot of people like that because the roads have been not good. So people are like, oh, we like him, he builds new roads. Then he was like, Well, I want to you know, I want to build new condominiums and stuff like that. And he saw this neighborhood of Shanxi. He's like, Oh, this neighborhood has been kind of run down, but it's by the river, you know. Some people want to live there. So we're gonna build this road there so we can have this big apartment building, and then people living in this apartment building can easily get back and forth to their apartments these new condominiums on the road right next to the river. And the people of the community were like, what are you talking about? We like that river front like it is. We don't want a big road there, you know? You know, because we, people looked at it and they didn't know what it meant to the community. They'd see, well, it's just kind of like barren land next to the water. There's not really anything there. You know, this kind of stuff you hear in Detroit. They're like vacant, nobody's doing anything there. But they're like, oh, what are you talking about? We walk our dogs there, we, we swim there. We have picnics there. We do all kinds of stuff there. We, we don't want some big road with cars. So they actually mounted this resistance campaign. This is one of the um, this is one of the images of all these different creative ways. Again, keep in mind there's artists too. So they're bringing this artistic sensibility to these protests. They had a whole protest in pink. Uh, this now is reminding me of Barbie again too. But yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think it had any Barbie connection at this point. So I mean, this is just one example of things. I have more slides later on of that, but I, I put them at the end. So, so they they. You had these two things, this, this sort of uh, creation of this site of the cabbage field, and then this resistance to this road project, and then this idea of this cabbage field opera, and they kind of came together, right? And this opera became kind of a manifestation of the spirit of this community, at the same time that it, sort of, it was fed by the spirit of resistance to this road. And this is the pamphlet for the cabbage field uh, opera uh, that they did. They actually ended up getting funds to go do the opera in Luxembourg first, and then, just so happened when I was there, they were getting ready to do another performance in Rotterdam in April. So I got to participate. If you go ahead. Um, so from the time I got there, I was invited to participate in these um, rehearsals. I'm like, I showed up. I don't speak Lithuanian. I can't sing either. I didn't ask anybody. <laughs> and um, they're like, no. Well, if you're here, you, you have to. You have to sing. You know, you have to be a part of the singing, right? So. So I started singing, and that's where this, what I was playing for you, the, this, the prologue, you know, that was the first thing I learned. It still like sticks in my head like crazy. These are the words for it. So, try and read that, right? But this is what they're singing here. That's the first line. <laughs> this is the name of the community, Shanti. It's kind of catchy, right? I like it. But anyway, so what, here's what it means, though. This is with the rough translation. So I have to look over here because I, I can't read it. Uh, where the river flows, oh, where the river flows, there are 20 shores. Sound you here in the districts. In the old town of Kunas, people have lived here for a long time. Not a building by fence, the earth is plowed by hand. And I can't read that last line. I think it says, and we don't cut the trees. This and we is, don't uh, cut the trees. Uh, as well, Lina says, is an oak tree, right? So the oak tree has a lot of significance in Lithuanian a lot of cultures, actually, because you know the oak tree hosts more bird species than any other tree. I think how many species? I think it's definitely it's like hundreds. I don't know. Oak trees, yeah, they're they're like they're like really important, you know, in terms of biodiversity, but they're also really important culturally because people historically have recognized the role of these trees and they're revered, and so. One of the things they're commenting on is the way that the nature is valued in Lithuanian culture, and particularly in Shanti. And they have these lines in here about we don't divide up with fences, right? We we, you know, we we work together. You know, we work together in this land, and we don't cut the oak tree. They talk about how if you had to do a development and build a new house, and there are oak trees in the way, you go around the oak tree. <laughs> you know, you don't cut the oak trees, right? So. Yeah, and this became also a basis of their sort of resistance to this what what Ed would call aggressive urbanization, right? So, so this is just some more uh, scenes from the church. So, I mean, the church is still actually very central 
in the life of the community. What's interesting to me is that like my friends in Ed, Ed and Vida, they, they they participated in the church. The kids were doing confirmation and confession. They do Easter and everything else. Um, but I never heard them like I never heard them like really talk about religion or Catholicism, anything like that, like in, in any of the conversations that we had, it was just a part of like life, what they did, it was part of the community. And they used the church as a basis of organizing things too. But anyway, I just thought it was kind of interesting how the church is woven into everything, but at the same time, the religiosity is of a different kind than the type of religiosity maybe that we see sometimes. So these are some of the drawings I did of people involved with the opera. This is Snieguele Urboniene. Snieguele was the, uh, the leader of the chorus. She also was the leader of the chorus of the church. She did more than anybody else, probably, to teach me how to sing a little bit. <laughs> and so, it's, and, then, and then Ed and Vida would always bring their dog, so the dog Silas was always there. And then this, I got to, I got to go listen in on a recording session in the Shanxi community, led by this by this guy Gedaminas. He's pictured on the left in this drawing, and then Donatus. He was my cold plunge friend. He was the rapper, and they did this. They had written this rap for the opera, but. They didn't really have, hadn't had a rapper do it yet. And Donatus came in and he did this. I was able to be there while they were recording this kind of weird combination of opera and rap music. Yeah. It was really kind of crazy, kind of really cool. And I'd love you to hear it if you wanted to. But I was able to be there while they were recording it. And then this is like one of the um, scenes of them practicing the dances for the opera. This couple, actually, they're a real a couple that were they had been involved in environmental movements in Lithuania, even in the Soviet period. They had been involved in protests about environmental contamination in the Baltic Sea and all kinds of things before uh, the independence. They were really interesting people. And this is from the performance in Rotterdam. I did, and that's Ed and Vida. I did a picture of Ed and Vida, like, because there was a spike scene in the opera. And I, so I sort of isolated them and I did the drawing because it was really pretty hard to draw the whole thing because it was like 20 different bodies, you know, actually more than that, fighting in this. <laughs> but I, I gave them this as a, as a present because to me it, resum it, it reflected the sort of fighting spirit that they had. And um, this is a, a, a video. This is um, that's Kopustu uh, Laukas is uh, means cabbage field in Lithuania, right? And so this is the sort of this video that you can actually watch on Vimeo of the opera in Rotterdam. Um, it, it, we could probably show a clip if we wanted. I don't think it's loaded on here, though, is it? No, it's not. Okay, go ahead. And then I was going to tie it back to this sort of government, the civil society piece that this group was also, in, in addition to being involved, and it's, I really got interested, and I would have these long conversations with Ed about it after we would go swimming at that pool across from the Latukas Garage Massacre. Uh, we'd go to the Acropolis Mall and have coffee and have these conversations. And... Um, and you talk a lot about how these different things fed each other, you know, the, this, 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 um, and so we start talking about social, it's not I'm a sociologist, right? So I'm like, well, what can I actually add here? You know, so here's some sociological terms, you know, collective efficacy and then collective effervescence, which is this idea of how when people get together in rituals and things like that, they create a kind of a spirit amongst them that raises them up as transcendent collective effervescence. Like when you're at a, at a rave party. I don't know you guys probably go to raves, right? <laughs> Stuff like that. You know, you're in a collective thing and your spirit, everybody's spirit is right. So there's this thing that comes out of people being together, especially in these kind of ritual ways. And then collective efficacy has to do with the ability of a group to do things, to work together, to accomplish things. So we talked about how this sort of collective effervescence that was evident in these protests and in this opera fed into the efficacy of the community. This is one of the uh, many, many community meetings I was able to attend at the Chunchi Library, where they would bring in people from all over the city, and then they would, uh, they got involved, really involved with this mayor's race, because they really didn't like this mayor at all. I don't know if you caught on to that. So this is one of those meetings, and, and Vita would always be translating for me and giving me notes and stuff, because they were, this is all Lithuanian, I could only catch a little bit. Go ahead, Tim. And then this, this old guy that was a uh, old former, uh, are you ever a former architect, retired architect, living in Shanxi? He had this whole big uh, folder of these drawings he had done of different buildings, and this is a map of Shanxi, which he he sold to me. But it was beautiful, so I bought it from him. And this is in the city building, a municipal building. So they would be down also in the city hall and bringing these, you know, uh, and then they'd always say, like, well, we, you know, we don't have civil society here like you have in the United States. You know, it's very small. We, don't, we, we need more civil society. I'm like, oh. You guys got it. Whatever it is you're doing, I wish we had it. So, 
Go ahead. And this is a, a mayoral a mayoral forum that they organized. The Shanxi Bendramini, that's their uh, flag, the yellow one, the Shanxi uh, Community Association. Uh, they organized this with all these other, these are all flags of the other communities from across the city of Conus. And they got all these mayoral candidates together for a candidates forum because they were wanted to uh, give all of them an opportunity to express their views because they really wanted to see if there's somebody that could like, you know, take on the mayor. And unfortunately, none of them were able to beat the mayor. But uh, again, they, they filled this big room. They, they, this is a whole big organizing thing. Um, so the politics, you know, was part and parcel in a way of the, uh, of the rest of it. Okay, go ahead. Oh, if you want a definition of collective effervescence and collective efficacy. You want to read that, Tim? Church employed the term collective effervescence to indicate how communal gatherings intensify, electrify, and enlarge religious experience. Bringing people together in close physical proximity generates a kind of electricity that quickly transports them into an extraordinary degree, degree of exaltation. Collective efficacy is defined as the perception of a group that can successfully work together to accomplish valued goals. Yeah, I, I had to bring you everywhere. Okay, go ahead. So um, these are just, again, some more illustrations of how different of both the collective efficacy and the collective uh, effervescence sort of side by side. You see these scenes from the Cabbage Field Opera, but then you also see these scenes of the protest. This is one of the protests over the road. And uh, again, we started to see how these things fed into each other um, and um, uh, sustained each other. Go ahead. I think I'm almost at the end here. Oh. So what do I say? They 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 started asking the question like amongst themselves, but what are we actually for? They said, you know, we can't just be against stuff. You know, going to pro being protesting against things is important, but we can't just be against things. We also have to know what we're for. So they said, rather than letting the people in power in the city in this case define what it is they're going to do next, when we say we don't want you to do this, and they actually won that battle, at least the first part of it, and they didn't build the road. And then the city was like, oh, these people don't want to do anything. He said, well, we're going to go to the city and we say, well, this is what we actually want to do. So they created this project called the Genia Solucci Project, which means the spirit of the place. It was this really incredible mapping and interviewing and mapping project where they, um, they, they that's Shanxi, the map over there, as you can see. And this is like a site in Shanxi. What they would do is they would ask people how they felt about these different sites in this neighborhood. And they would record on this map their different thoughts about these different places. And they had three categories. One was sort of everyday life, like the, where are the places that you go, the things that mean the most to you. One was nature. So they had a whole set of questions focused on nature. And then they had one about um, the future, right? Like what do you want this community to be? What would you like to see here? So I just have some examples from the Mini Sochi project in these slides of, um, oh, these are some other examples of, I got to go uh, forest bathing when I was there in the Panamunas forest. And that was Silas the dog I told you about earlier. Like, and that was me, me and Silas getting into, I'd stick my head in a log, you know, breathe in all the tree pheromones. Do trees have pheromones? Yeah. So um, interestingly, you know, forest bathing is something Shinrin Yoku is called in Japanese. It's become kind of like a worldwide phenomenon or trend now coming in of Japan. And it's, it's still a foreign thing sort of in Lithuania, which is really interesting because they have this intense sort of cultural attachment to nature, but people are now trying to introduce, because it, it gives people a new way to value nature in terms of what it brings, because of course, in this free market economic system, when you're in these battles and they say, well, what is this land actually worth? Nobody's doing anything with it. You know, it doesn't have any market value. You can say, well, actually this land has all this kinds of value. You know, we can show it, it shows as value for health as involved value in terms of community and so on. So anyway, that was just in there to show you the, the sort of uh, a nature attachment. So. This is a map of different proposals people have put together uh, for the community of Shanxi again over there. And I have a couple examples of things people have proposed, I think in the next slide. Um, here's something where a person, again, they put a photograph into the map and they can say kind of what they want. Can you read that? Yeah. There should be a little garden with colorful flowers and trees near the river, a calm place that people can enjoy. It is very important to preserve the natural environment as well as its beauty and its fundamental to protect trees and natural species, and it's uh, on the riverbank. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Excellent. You can come up here. So, um, 
And these are some more images uh, from the uh, from the riverbank, uh, frozen riverbank here, showing how people are using the river. So these are pictures that I took. You can see that even in the middle of winter, people are, you know, walking their dogs and actively actively using the river um, in different ways. This was a proposal to do something. There are these staircases all throughout Conus. I really became fascinated with these staircases. They kind of connect different parts of neighborhoods. It's a way to kind of get around. Uh, and once you learned where they were, you know, you could sort of get from here to here without having to go all down the roads like that. Um, and I didn't have a car or anything when I was there, so I walked a lot. And they have a pretty good, pretty decent public transportation system. But, but um, so this was a proposal to do something with one of these neighborhood staircases. And then I put some of my own proposals in. So the next one I think is one of mine, where I suggested taking the staircase and you know doing. This is actually a real life staircase from Los Angeles. Apparently, it's one of the most popular places to take a selfie in Los Angeles. Yeah. All they did was paint it different colors and put a heart on it. You know, but think about that. Conus has these staircases all over the place. I was saying, you guys, you should be. Every neighborhood could do their staircase, like in the theme of like their neighborhood. You know, so this is what they started doing: is developing this kind of comprehensive vision for what they want their neighborhood to be. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Okay, I'm gonna conclude with this very Lithuanian metaphor, which actually I got from Ed. Ed is actually not Lithuanian, but Irish. But um, so Ed likes to talk a lot in metaphors, and I do too. So I love that about him. But he would, he would talk about how all these little spontaneous happenings in the community, like these events, like these these protests, uh, you know, parties, different things that happen in the community, are like little mushrooms that come up, come up suddenly, and they have a lot of energy, right? Um, and all these phenomena are taking place, and you can actually you can you can make more of them happen, right? He's like, but. All these little mushrooms don't necessarily translate into something that's lasting. You know, they're all because mushrooms don't mushrooms pop up and they, they they reveal the sort of what's going on underneath the surface. They're 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 manifestations of something going on beneath the surface. They don't last the way an oak tree lasts. So he was like talking about, well, we have all these little mushrooms of things going on, but how do we get to the oak tree, right? And I was like, well, I'm gonna do you one better, since you know I've read a little bit of ecology. And I said, you know. We're now saying that the mycelium, which is the network underneath the ground from which the mushrooms come, mushrooms are just the fruit of the mycelium, right? That's not the actual organism. Is interconnected with the oak trees, right? So when you're when you're talking about what's going on with the mushrooms on the surface, all this activity of the mushrooms on the surface is actually related to what's going on with the oak trees at the same time. So if you think about this in relationship to community, because Ed's so a really big goal was to build civil society. He's like, we need to have a strong, vibrant civil society. Otherwise, democracy doesn't work. He's like, you can have boats and you can have all that, but if you don't have civil society, if you don't have people that are active, that are representing community, they're saying community has a right to define it's this, what it, what it, certain conditions or to protect its culture, whatever the case may be, and then they're not able to organize, they don't have the efficacy to demand things. Then. Democracy is just a formality, right? You have to have this vibrant civil society. And so we talked about this mushroom oak idea. And it's like, if you think about the mushroom as being the spontaneous outpourings of, you know, um, energy, right? And then the oak is being something that's more lasting, that you're building something that's gonna last beyond your own, maybe multiple generations. Then the civil society is even bigger than that. It's like, it's like the forest, right? That, um, that is composed of all these little oak trees, but is itself something larger than the sum of its parts. The forest is something that itself is an or is an entity, an organi organism, right? That uh, has kind of an intrinsic uh, value to it. Sort of something that's something that Lithuanians understand because the forest is, um, you know, a part of their culture. And as I said earlier, I'm not Lithuanian by heritage. I am part Polish. And I also got a chance to go to Poland this summer. And I think that's my last official slide, except for my thank you slide. Achu, by the way. Everybody say Achu. Achu. Achu Labai. That's thank you. Did you know that, Charles? Achu Labai. See if this will play. Uh, Tim, see if this will play. Three. <laughs> Tam kurt videšim krantu, tam čičo garsus rajonas kūnas tano namiesta.
That was that was Ed and Vida. You can see I was trying to follow along, but I didn't have the sheet of paper in front of me, so I couldn't remember all the words. Okay. So I just had a few more thank you slides. If you can just go through them, I want to thank some other people in case they're watching on Zoom. I don't think three, three. <laughs> That's Ed in the coffee place. That's where we go for coffee. Go ahead. Thank you, Ed. Achu. These are all the kids. I didn't mention them, but I, I volunteered uh, one or two days a week at the Caritas. Uh, which is a Catholic sort of social services. A lot of orphan kids, foster kids go there for activities. So I would go there and do activities with the kids, usually like art related activities. And some of them were actually Ukrainian kids too that were there. Um, that little boy there right next to me, that's Lukas. He was my little buddy. Yeah. Um, this is Rita Namikina. She was awesome. Um, this is, she took me to this uh, the swamp to see it before I left. She's like, I have some places I want to show you before you go. And this was in through translation because Rita didn't speak much English or wasn't comfortable with it. But I want to read this in Lithuanian. Uh, and in Latvian, you say Paldias means thank that you. Oh, that's that's uh Paldias, Paldias, Sveiki. Enormo Gotus Bet Ashishkano. and go to the next one. You speak Latvian. It says, I don't want to brag. But I'm from Kaunas. And this is an old saying they had in Kaunas because they say, yeah, Kaunas is like this chill place. We have the saying here. Do, I don't you, want to brag. do you understand Latvian? So this was uh, my friend, your other friend, Yurata. There were a lot of Yuratas. There was another Yurata Tafite who helped me out a lot in terms of some of the neighborhood projects I got involved with. And that, of course, is my friend Donatus taking me on one last cold plunge before I left Lithuania at the end of April. And uh, so I think I will end there. And I will thank you all. And uh, when you really, really like somebody in Lithuania, what you do at the end is these are extra slides that if, if people want to ask more, but I wasn't going to go through all of them. Okay, okay, um, you go, you, everybody goes, achu, 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 achu. Okay, see, thanks. My wife is achuing me. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're gonna so that's the end of my formal presentation. We're going to limit our question period to 20 minutes because I do want to leave some time in. For rebuttals, it's now 7.44 at 6.44 at 7.05. We'll get into a rebuttal period. Who's got questions? And if you want to say it, speak loud, please. Louder if you can. We only talked a little bit about the Ukrainian uh, defense against the Russian uh, invasion. Uh, are people volunteering from Lithuania to assist fight? The Ukrainians fight? They actually fight? You know, I, I'm, I didn't meet and know anybody that was going to, to fight. There were a lot of people who were organizing like caravans of aid. And then also, of course, a big, huge thing that Lithuania was doing along with Poland was uh, bringing lots of, uh, lots of Ukrainians were coming there and they were offering support, especially to mothers and children. Because most of the Ukrainian men couldn't leave, right? Because they have to stay and fight. So there were a lot of women, a lot of the people coming from Ukraine are women. So there were a lot of jobs that were offered. Uh, that were being filled by uh, Ukrainians in Lithuania as well, especially in Poland. That's what Poland also, like I said, in May and June. And Gdansk, have... like a quarter of the population of Gdansk. Okay. I, I have a question. All right, Lana, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, first of all. Oh, yourself, um, Lana. Okay, I'm from Latvia, actually, a long time ago. So, anyhow, I'm citizen. I'm okay. <laughs> so, uh, my question is. Do you understand uh, Latviski? Uh, you runas in Latviski? No, you don't understand Latvian language, or you? I don't. I, I can hard, I don't understand Lithuanian. Very little. <laughs> I did go to Latvia. I did go to Latvia, and Latvia yeah. has its own dramatic history. With did you? This. Did you ever was in Riga, Latvia? Yes, Riga is a beautiful place. I oh, also Riga. went to Jormala. Yeah, Jormala. On yeah. the sea, and I did a yeah. cold there. So you was recently or a long time ago? This was in, um, I was in Yormala, I think in, in April. So you don't understand yeah. Latvian at all, no? Not a couple of words, no? A couple of words you that were shared with Lithuanian. I think Latvian is the closest to Lithuanian of the languages. Yeah, Lithuanian. because I'm pretty long time from Latvia, but uh, you know, That's still keeping language. Yeah. You know, culture, uh, cultures. So uh, I just tell you very quick greeting in Latvian. 
Give us a greeting in Latvian. You know how greeting in Latvian sveiki. Sveicina. That's also in Lithuanian, actually. Yeah, sveicina. Thank you, Paldies. Paldies. All right. Well, I'm afraid of these guys back okay. here. What yeah, are they going to yeah, say? Yeah. Now, in the history of Lithuania, I don't know if I'm sure what they call the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Yeah. It was a thing. It was real. They have a lot of arguments back and forth about it because, of course, the Poles want to take credit for it and the Lithuanians want to take credit for it. It's greatness, you know, because it lasted centuries, right? The Polish, it was one of the like longest enduring and most stable uh, political entities, I think, in that part of the world. I mean, there's, and they say at one point it extended from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Yeah, all the way to what is now Ukraine. Yeah, but um, so the thing with... Uh, the language of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was Polish. That was what the nobles spoke, right? And Lithuanian was at that time was a language more like a peasant language, which is associated with the land that we now call Lithuania. But Lithuania, this is where it gets really complex. If you read any of Tim Snyder's work on this, that nationalism, of course, was a construct of the 19th, late 19th, early 20th centuries, where they created clean lines where there weren't really clean lines before. So Lithuania as a term referred to the language on the one hand, but also referred to this land. And sometimes to this to this empire or this it was a commonwealth. Well, that's actually the remarkable. It wasn't an empire. It was what we consider might be kind of quasi democratic structure. But um, but yeah, I, I you know it's a lot of history. I tried to learn a little bit about all of it, but I'm not an expert on history of Polish Lithuania. Yeah, I, I thought Lithuania was more of a Luther background and not having candidates and stuff. And origin. No. No, I mean, it's very strongly Catholic. There are other religious groups and traditions. There's even, I have a colleague at Vitautis Magnus University who studies sociology of religion. And uh, one of her specialties is the minority religions of, of Lithuania, like the Seventh-day Adventists and um, Christian scientists. I mean, all the small little sects and things. But Lutheranism was not a big, I think there, I'm sure there are Lutherans there, but it's not a big part of what family of language is it? so Lithuania and Latvian are related is Baltic languages I'm not sure what the official so I'm not a linguist either what the official name of the family of languages is but they're really not related to Estonian even though they're part of the Baltic states Estonian is actually more closely related to Finnish and Hungarian I believe there's some similarities because there are some Asian origins to Finnish and uh, so Finnish is very, very different, but Latvian and, and Lithuanian are, are, they say that they can sort of understand each other, um, but they're different. They're not Slavic languages either. They say that they're very proud of the language. I said that Lithuanians will tell you, and there's some research supporting this, but again, these are things you can't really prove definitively, that it, 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 it has elements in common with Sanskrit, and it's actually such an ancient language. That's that it true. To the, um, That's true. Yeah. Yeah, there's well, that's 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 there are linguistic elements, but the, the story is not known exactly of how you know Lithuanian got to be where I don't think, but but yeah, so again, it's a matter of great pride for Lithuanians. The language is central to the identity of the culture as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. Uh, you have somebody online? Go ahead, Kelvin. Yeah, um, I worked with a couple of quite a few um, uh, Lithuanians a few years back, uh, even last. Um, I wonder what you thought about if you come across uh, the rock music at all, the heavy metal music that they have there. There's some very, very vibrant heavy metal scene. I, I, I got from uh, the guys I was working with. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah. But it's Iranian heavy metal. Yeah. Oh, you know that. oh gosh, I wish I'd seen some Lithuanian heavy metal. No, I didn't see any Lithuanian heavy metal while I was there. I did see. Um, <clears throat> Some Lithuanian jazz. They have a jazz festival in Kaunas, which is interesting. They have a little like a jazz. I didn't find a lot of live music in Kaunas actually, which is interesting to me. There weren't like a lot of live music venues. I, I did find this one place eventually where they they had like a jazz um, like a jazz workshop on Tuesdays. You could go and see like local students perform jazz and things like that. And then I said I saw the Ukrainian band play in this underground bunker. That was pretty great. But I didn't see, uh, which is not to say that it doesn't, I was there in, of course, in January through February, so you wouldn't have outdoor yeah. festivals really happening. Okay. Well, go on. Okay, who's, uh, Sid, go ahead. Be, be 
All right, said. Yeah. What kind of uh, class do you talk to? Would you say intellectual from the middle class, or do you talk to plain working people? So, um, I a lot of my colleagues at the university and people who spoke English, of course, which are sort of yeah. definition more educated people. They're not all necessarily like, you know, um, middle class doesn't means doesn't really mean the same thing. I don't, it doesn't seem like, so class distinctions in Lithuania were interesting. I talk to people about this a lot that um, inside the city of Konis, like, you know, you'd see people that, people that work with their hands, mm -hmm. artisans, mm -hmm. things like that. People that work in the shops and people that worked at the university, they're, you know, there are kind of differences in class and status, but they're, you know, everybody's kind of going to the same places and shopping in the same places. And so uh, through the, the neighborhood community uh, that I spent a lot of time with in the opera, a lot of the people in the, were, were just regular working people. You know, some of them had backgrounds yes. in university or academics or other yes. things. Yes. Other ones, they worked for NGOs or something like that, but others oh, were like, gosh. you know, they, they were, um, they were regular kind of working people or work, you know, um, or housewives or things like that. So um, I, because I didn't, I, I tried to learn a little Lithuanian, but one thing you see in Lithuania is that the older, uh, older generations are more likely to not speak English, right? So the, the, if, you're, if you're talking to people who are speaking English, they're more likely to be younger, more educated people and probably relatively more affluent. So like my colleagues at the university, um, I guess you consider them an intellectual class that a lot of people I spoke to there. But then in the neighborhood organization, it was it was different. Okay, but, I have a question. I know, um, you already, already had one. We're going to go to Charlie next. Okay, Charlie. Charlie. Yes. Miss All right. Um, was there any discussion among the Lithuanians? The Russians maintained that Lithuania was not supposed to be a member of NATO and that affiliation was not authorized for a treaty. Did you encounter any discussion specifically about the Lithuanian participation in NATO affairs? Well, I mean, Lithuanians are all on board with NATO. They want, you know, if anything, they want more NATO, I think. In fact, I did see a lot of soldiers that were, you know, were being activated through Lithuania in the time that I was there coming through Conus. Um, so, I mean, Lithuania is in a position, they're a small country, like I said, 3 million people. They're not, they're not a wealthy country. Um, in terms of European countries, they're, they're probably in the, somewhere in the bottom third, I would say, in terms of like kind of average income. You know, compared to Western European countries, they're not a wealthy country. Um, and so what they get out of e, EU membership is in a way a lot more than they put in from their standpoint. I mean... They're a small country and they feel if they didn't have membership in NATO or protection from NATO, they would be basically sitting ducks because they're next to Belarus. Belarus is basically a puppet state of uh, Putin in their view. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, there's no questioning. Um, you know, Poland's a little bit different. You know, Poland has some sort of, you know, has kind of an anti-EU um, movement in Poland, similar, you know, to some of the things, you know, Trump. sort of nativist. Okay. Politics, I have There's a little of that in Lithuania, but not as a big, it's not a big national factor. Okay, that okay, about. Lana, we'll get you next, and then we'll just go, go uh, ahead, quick, Lana. Okay. Yeah, very quickly, thank you. Mr. Drauss, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, um, medical care and education in Lithuania? It's some pre-education and some pre-medical care, or like here, like most, it's private, or some exist, like some, uh, you know, some public medical care and, and school education. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I, I did have uh, some medical problems when I was there. I didn't have to go to a hospital. I did go to a pharmacist. So that was, as I was advised by somebody to, you know, go, go to see the pharmacist, because the pharmacists know a lot. Um, here's a few things that I learned about the medical system when I was there. One, I did have a friend that visited from Detroit, and it was his parents, his elderly parents, and one of them slipped and fell. This was, you know, in the winter, right? And hit her face on the ground and actually had to go to emergency room. So I did get to go to a Lithuanian hospital, no, not for myself. 
Um, no, question. And uh, question. It's, it, the care was the care for Lithuanians is free. It's free to them, you know, in, in that system. Now they do have a private system sort of exists alongside it. If you have more money and you want to like cut the line or get access to certain kinds of services, you can sort of pay for it. Private physician, but a lot of people I talked to said, well, for you know, if you just it's like what I had, which was like a you don't want to know the details. It's like a gastrointestinal thing. You know, why I'm because, you, you know why I'm asking? Because, you know, Lithuania is a small country, and I thought maybe more. I, I will say like, this uh, also. So the one thing is the free uh, care and... Education, uh, free education and free medical care, maybe. And they also have <laughs> medical tourism. So some people, it's cheaper to get medical care in Lithuania. So you'll have people coming from England, say... Um, so I met a few people that were students in Lithuania. They were studying for their medical degrees, and they were coming from England or also from... Uh, developing countries and the, the cost of the education in Lithuania is much cheaper than other European countries but it's comparable in quality because it's a European country so there are these kind of little disparities that they can sort of take advantage of in the sense that they have comparable quality but their costs are relatively lower and so you have some people that would come for medical education there for that reason and also some people come to seek medical services there for that reason okay who was out who was next Wait, no no hang on hang on well, we'll wait, wait for those for the rebuttal period on the comments. All right. Uh, who's okay? Mike Lehman. Hmm. So, what are the major reasons? Oh, geez. Um, no, I mean, you know, they're like, they're like, I think they're trying to get more into, into like tech and things like that because they don't have, they don't have a lot of, I mean, the one natural resource that they have an abundance of is, is the forests. And there's been some exploitation of Lithuanian forests, like IKEA, they buy IKEA furniture. They they har they harvest forests in Lithuania, um, but they're not a country that's rich in natural resources. So they have to the agriculture. It's a big agricultural country too. All kinds of things. I mean, it's actually very similar to Michigan, where you know, I'm from. It's like yeah. lots of fruit. Um, There's out there also building a big railway to all three countries right now. From according to the European Union, they're building a new freight railway and passenger line, linking all three countries together. Three countries meaning Latvia, Lithuania, okay, and Estonia. Yeah. So they do have these issues of uh, you know the gauge of the railways uh, in some areas is still on the Soviet gauge, which is different than what the EU uses. So it's you know in Latvia, I rode the train in Latvia. That was really cool, but it was it was a different kind. Of, it was like a Soviet kind of train there. Um, like, a, like they were big cars, you know. And somebody told me that when you go from Poland to Ukraine, that's what you have to do. They have to change to like a separate set of rails because Ukraine still has the, the Russian or Soviet rails. Uh, honestly, I'm sorry. I don't know. I think the economy, though, is, is, is you know, a lot of agriculture. They're trying to build up their tech sector, you know, and then but they have a big problem with brain drain. I mean, like a lot of these small countries, people that get educated, they, they leave to go. Germany, England, or maybe not England as much or the U.S., right? They want to come to the U.S make money okay and then you'll go back yeah. you have a question yes okay a little louder please if you don't mind the universities like a lot of european universities i think are mostly Free, I think they may have to pay, you know, because a lot of systems have been moving towards a bit of an American model and they're requiring people to pay something in terms of tuition, but it's nothing, nothing like here. You know, in fact, when we tell people like our students come over there and they say, Well, how did you how did you get here? How'd you come here? And our students say, Well, I had I paid, you know, I had to pay, I paid for the class, I had to pay to come over here, and they're like, What? Like your you know, your government doesn't pay for that, your school doesn't pay for that. It's like because the EU has a lot of programs where they'll send students to other countries and they pay for the whole thing, you know. They, they actually have a hard time getting enough students to do it. They, 
they're doing these little micro programs now to get people to come for a week because they say we don't have students don't want to go and spend a whole semester. <laughs> um, so it's very different than here. I think it's a kind of a um, expectation of certain level of government support for higher ed. In terms of elementary schools, I, I do remember there there is a there are Catholic schools and private schools that people do pay for, um, but the public school system is. Uh, I believe a totally free system, at least free at the point of okay. use. It's paid for through taxation, of course. Okay, Charlie, last question. Oh, yes, yeah, so, I have to hang on. Hey, did you have? Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, two more, Charlie. You've already gone. I'll, I'll let Mike go and then we'll get you. Um, I'm going to have to, um, okay. And then they had, you know, I was actually in Lithuania when, when the pandemic started, I was there in March of 2020 and I had just come back and, and that was right about the time we started to lock down and mask here. They had, at that time, I think they only had like a couple of cases that appeared in Lithuania and they never had that many, but you know, they went through a lot of the same things that other European countries did as far as a pandemic lockdown. Uh, I'm not sure what their vaccination rate was in Lithuania. So of course Poland was a little bit more. I was in Poland too when they sort of when they sort of declared the pandemic over and they just kind of stopped wearing masks, so, which was earlier than when we did it actually. Um, but they never had like as many as many cases in the first place. So I'm not actually sure what the vaccination rate is. And I didn't hear you know they they didn't have like a big COVID politics thing. Okay. That people talked about. All right. You, uh, go ahead. Um, you know, uh, Chernobyl was a very, very big deal in Belarus. And Belarus was close to the mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering is what, what did you hear about uh, radiation and the effect of radiation? And uh, did it, did, were people still conscious of what happened to Chernobyl and uh, how it affected the state? So um, I did get to, I, you know, I didn't hear anything about like the, Chernobyl is actually in Ukraine, but close to Belarus border, I think, but still. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, and I and actually, I don't know if this is a smart thing to do, but I actually watched the Chernobyl series while I was in Lithuania. Because uh -huh. uh, you're right. And when you look at the map, it's actually not that far. It's like, you know, a thousand kilometers or something like that. And then, you know, the wind is just, like yeah. wind doesn't respect natural boundaries of course um there was a here's an interesting thing i'm not sure it's in terms of the effects today um but of course at the time lithuania was part of the same system and the soviets had built a very similar nuclear reactor in lithuania it's a place called visaginas i actually went to visit it it's still there they're in the process of it was decommissioned uh, more than 10 years ago as a requirement of the eu membership and they're still taking it apart. It's this massive, huge okay. thing. It's the same model as Chernobyl. They had, it was built like in the middle of this forest and they created, essentially created a town around it because it was sort of supposed to be a secret that it was there. And a lot of the people that live in this town, because there's still people living there, even though there's not really any economy there anymore, uh, the majority of the people living there today are Russian speakers. And a lot of them actually had come from other parts of the Soviet Union. They're physicists. You know? So it's this kind of, some people, one of my colleagues, in Conus in at the university said it's the strangest place in all the Lithuania because <laughs> okay. you have this sort of population of Russian speakers that are just sort of hanging around in the middle of this forest with this you know this decommissioned nuclear plant nearby in this city that was essentially just built in, in the Soviet style so if you watch um the Chernobyl show have you seen that parts of it were filmed there actually and then the bridge the bridge that uh, that they used for one of the big scenes is actually in Conus, and now it's marked. You can go see the Chernobyl bridge there. Okay, Charlie, last question, and then we're going to let go to rebuttals. Yes, uh, uh, Paul, the uh, Lithuania culturally is seemingly is more oriented towards the West and the United States. And it certainly is not Scandinavian by any means, yet it certainly has no ties with the Russian <laughs> Slavic. I mean, its language is not Slavic by any means whatsoever. What possible explanation can there be? Was this 
I've heard it was due to cultural exchange in the early part of the 20th century with the United States that it adopted such things as basketball, for instance. Do you have any concept or feelings you got? We're thinking, thoughts regarding that. I didn't quite catch the question. Kim, could you? Why is Lithuania seemingly more oriented towards the West than the other countries in the region? Um, I mean, I think all the Baltic states are very Western oriented. I think Poland is, is sort of the exception, maybe. I mean, um, and I think that part of the issue is with Poland that's different is the size of Poland. You know, uh, the economy of Poland is much, much bigger. These small countries, they recognize, again, that they, they have a big stake in being a part of the EU. They don't have a big enough population economy to support themselves independently of the EU. Um, Poland really, I don't think, wants to, would not want to separate from the EU either, but they have this more of an independent street. They have a very big you know, um, a population economy, so they have more of a kind of a, a push and pull, I think, with the EU in terms of politics. But um, to, to my mind, I think that's a major one is the, um, they, they've made the choice, actually as, you, as Ukraine has, you know, as Ukraine has chosen, the, the, the population of Ukraine has chosen to align themselves culturally, politically with Western democracies versus, um, you know, um, Putin or Russia. Away. So I think the difference with the Baltic states is that they, because of their size, they're uniquely sort of vulnerable and so they, uh, there's a, there's an element of self, of a practical, you know, self-preservation as well as a, a political orientation because they do have, uh, in Lithuania at least, they do have also very, you know, they're very more conservative in a lot of ways than, than your sort of Western European countries are in terms of culture and politics, even in terms of environmentalism and things like that. People, there, there are a lot of people that are like, ah. Global warming, what's that? You know, because you know, it doesn't really affect them directly. So a lot of people, like anywhere else, are like, well, they say that's happening, but you know, I don't really, you know, we have plenty of water here, you know, and it's not, you know, so there is skepticism about some of those things. Uh, sexuality, and that's a big thing. Like, I think they're much more conservative, and there's a lot more um, um, sort of hesitation about accepting changing sexual norms in Lithuania and uh, then in certainly in sort of, um, Western Europe. Estonia, I think, is, is actually more liberal in that respect. Poland, Lithuania would probably be a little bit more like Poland in that respect. Anyway, thank you. All right. let's, thank, let's thank our speaker now. We're now going to go to rebuttals. I got both the screen up. I got one. How many of you here are going to do rebuttals? Okay, one, two, three. Charlie, I know you're going to have one. And then um, uh, who else? All right, we're going to go. We're going to go up with. Uh, we'll go about four minutes each. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do the first one, and then we'll go to online as I see Dean fit. So come on up and uh, let's get going here on our rebuttals. Now we're only going to go about 30 minutes because we want to get out of here by uh, 840, 845, I mean, I mean, 745. So, all right. And then our speaker will get the last word. Let's give him one more round of applause. One of the best ones I've heard in a while. All right, uh, go ahead. Uh, I want you to defer my time until I ask Andy, have you been collecting dues from people who, that, that this is their first time here? Oh, okay. All right, um, so I wanted to compare the, uh, the response of the city of Kaunas to the neighborhood of whatever he said it was, the Sochi, uh, to the cop city thing in Atlanta, where um, the people are trying to preserve a forest in Atlanta and the, um, the police in Atlanta have actually killed some of the protesters, or at least one of them, and are arresting protesters, and they are uh, they are cutting down that forest and putting in a um, police academy there. And the people have tried very, very, very hard to preserve their forest, 
and it's just not working there. And I also wanted to say, I live at the beach and um, a, a few years ago, they were going to run Lakeshore Drive down through Rogers Park, right through my neighborhood. Uh, I didn't live there at the time. It was, so that's been, it's gotta be 40 years ago. And um, a woman named um, um, Prins, Toby Prins, organized the neighborhood and she had everybody send a teaspoonful of sand in an envelope to the mayor and tell him that we did not want Lakeshore Drive going through Rogers Park. And uh, the, the protest was effective and we do not have Lakeshore Drive going through Rogers Park now. And as a result of that, I was able to get an apartment at the beach and I live at the beach. And um, then I also wanted to talk about um, the fact that Estonia sends um, spend, spend, sends radioactive waste to a place in Utah called White Mesa. And uh, it's a, a very unusual thing that there's a mill there that accepts waste from uh, the, the uh, Baltic states. Baltic, yeah, the Baltic states, and I, and then read read the question I asked the speaker. Um, Kate Brown wrote a book called um, Manual for Survival about the uh, explosion at Chernobyl, and in this book she explained that when Chernobyl blew up. The Russians sent a lot of, sent airplanes with cloud seeding, and they made sure that the rain fell on Belarus. And I thought that it was possible that uh, Latvia could have been involved or could have been uh, victimized by the fact that they made sure the rain fell in Belarus before it got to Moscow. And, oh, I, uh, they they made they made sure of that and that was why I asked the speaker the question about uh, the outfall from Chernobyl and how it might have affected Lithuania. Um, let's see. Um, I really think that's about all I wanted to talk about. But I was so interested in the fact that the neighborhood that he spoke of was able to effectively protest the idea of taking away their forest, not like in Atlantic City where they actually killed one of the, yeah, I know my, my time is up. Okay, next, next rebutter, please. Next rebutter, please. Go ahead. Got about three to four minutes. Well, whatever. Yeah, that was a great presentation about Lithuania. I grew up in a Lithuanian neighborhood in Chicago back in the day. Uh, there was a hall, actually, these legion halls were called Darius Grinis. Uh, these pilots are very reverent. In fact, I read quite a bit about Darius and Grinis because they actually flew somewhere out of New York, way across the Atlantic. And actually, what my findings were is that they actually were shot down by the Germans. Uh, right on the border between Lithuania and uh, at that time the German area. And what's another thing great about Darius Grinis is the airplane motor was was that was was re-engineered in a little plant in it was a place to call uh, Clearing, Illinois. So they did some work on that motor, that Pratt Whitney radi radial motor. And they did something to beef it up. And then that, that and I, you know, like I said, that was I in the Chicago neighborhood. The only other couple of things is Lithuanian women. Oh, yeah. My, my ma was Lithuanian and my dad was Irish. <laughs> my ma had the say of the house. He was the absolute authoritarian. The women my mother knew were all authoritarian women. So, uh, <laughs> To say that people come over looking for women, if they want an authoritarian woman, they would probably find one. 
And then finally cabbage, we had cabbage a lot in the family because I'm like I said, my mom was full of Lithuanian, my dad was Irish and a lot of sauerkraut, but a lot of, a lot of great Lithuanian cooking, you know, uh, but a great presentation for not being a Lithuanian. Thank you. All right, Charlie, you're next with Rebot. All right, Charlie. All right, let me get my picture up there. First of all, I want to thank Paul for very interesting. I'll be eclectic as usual very quickly. Uh, I was personally acquainted with Val. He was a federal employee. He was the EPA guy. Uh, I, I knew him in the government. And he was noted for going against, actually, the instructions of Ronald Reagan. He stood up to Ronald Reagan. The language is standalone and is one of the oldest languages on Earth, unrelated to other languages. And it is, in fact, uh, dated alongside Sanskrit. Um, there were cultural exchanges. I myself, uh, we ran into some Lithuanian guys, and we taught them how to play basketball, and they taught us this new game we never really did before called soccer. So that's what I mean, it was cultural exchanges, and that's how they ended up with basketball from exchanges from the 20s and 30s. Uh, Lithuania has been an active participant in NATO, and has fought aside American forces in the Middle East and Afghanistan. They're most noted for having uh, detachments on motorbikes, motorcycles, uh, that swiftly moving about, um, a mobile fighting force on motorbikes. That's been in the news, innovative here. Uh, the Yellow Cross is, during the Soviet occupation, but then it's had this big hill with all kinds of crosses on it, and allegedly a, a Soviet guy and Russians drove a tank over it, and they put the crosses back up, but that's what the Soviets thought of the yellow crosses. Uh, the king of Lithuania, when Lithuania became independent in 1918, they wanted to have this king he referenced from the 13th century on the money, but they had no pictures of him. So the, they hired an artist, and he quoted you a picture of himself. <laughs> that's the king of Lithuania. And that's the king picture appeared on the money. Uh, I'm running a Lithuanian underground with my sister right now. We have some apartments that are all occupied by Lithuanians. Uh, we're just here, just reaching the States. Um, there was another thing. The Russians strictly forbid Lithuanians to have that flag, that yellow, green, and red flag. But however, the day after they declared their independence, the nation was festooned with Lithuanian flags, which suddenly appeared overnight. They had kept them in hiding for 50 years uh, in various places. Um, the, my father maintained that we were, in fact, Mongolians, uh, which there is some validity to, but he claimed we were Lithuanian hillbillies and actually Mongolian stock. Yeah, they pay a lot of attention to this opera stuff. Most of the operas are pretty somber and serious and, I mean, dark singing uh, ominously, but yes, for some reason, Lithuanian opera is a unique cultural feature here. Um, let's see, I think that's about it. Oh, well, the other thing is, the Lithuanians wanted to keep the Russians out, so recently I, I noticed they built a chain link fence like you would have in your backyard on the border between <laughs> Russia and Lithuania for some apparent reason, but uh, they just wanted uh, to have that uh, up on the I guess the indicated is the reason I ended up in the United States is my grandfather, there were seven brothers, and one of whom was my father, and he did not want the boys to serve in the Tsarist army, and he came over in 1900 uh, to the United States. My brother, my father was an infant, but that was the reason we ended up in the United States, first in the 
I had relatives in the coal mines of Pennsylvania and Southern, then they went to Southern Illinois, and that's how I ended up here. My mother came to Chicago from Southern Illinois, because uh, there were no, there's nothing for young women to do in these small mining towns. But anyhow, thanks a lot very much. I'm glad we got a good audience. It was an interesting topic. And, um, you know, Achu Labai. Okay, Ellen, go ahead. Okay, yes. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, I actually have a, um, my, my brother-in-law is uh, Lithuanian and my, um, I've got a good friend who's Lithuanian here in Chicago and but I didn't know as much about it. But um, the one thing I'd known was that he, he supposedly his grandfather worked for the, I think the czar or somebody too. They're Peter or is it kind of near St. Petersburg or something? I, it, it's an interesting place in terms of, uh, you know, being old, having that old uh, czarist kind of background. <laughs> but, um, and also my other friend, Indra, she, um, she would have these events in the South where she we'd put flowers on our hair and stuff. And so there's something about that. I could identify with that natural, like a summer solstice event, right? And yeah, right. And so, uh, yeah, that was, um, it is, it's interesting the way you picked up on that, the nature and the religion and um, I, you know, I also know some people from Romania, and uh, it's, it's so to them, it's so important with the Bible and everything. And then, as I have gotten here, though, I'm more, I've become kind of a left wing communist. So, I've, <laughs> it's, it strikes me as strange that there's so little, um, a kind of anti Russian uh, point of view. So, that's all I got. Thank you. All right. Who is that? Anybody? Uh, come on. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you walk up there? Do you want me to bring the mic to you? All right, give me a second. We'll bring the mic to you. Hang on a minute, please. All right, we're going to do Sid Cohen next year as soon as I get the mic to him. All right, hang on, Sid. Uh, let me get the uh, camera. Just a second there, Sid. Uh, all right, one are Okay, so go ahead. Well, people don't uh, actually realize that they have um, this type of medicine, socialized medicine in Europe, but they don't understand what actually happened. The Soviet Union, when it had the revolution, automatically, after a period of time, they brought in socialist medicine. So the other countries didn't want uh, communism, so they've done the same thing in order to counter the Soviet Union. Now, if we um, look back to history, and if we look back to the 1800s, the, um, I forgot, what's his name? Uh, the the um, Chancellor in 1800s, was running against Karl Marx's party. And Karl Marx's party was making inroads into the, into the population. So what he done, he brought in some, um, some reforms like Roosevelt. And these reforms, I don't know if they had socialized medicine, but they had reforms, and that's the, uh, actually the reason for it. Anybody else? Uh, well, I, I wanted to say something. Um, the reason there's so much anti-Russian thinking right now is because Lithuania doesn't want to be invaded again. Okay? Estonia doesn't want to be invaded and annexed again. Poland doesn't want to be 
activated again and annexed again. Um, a million Poles uh, uh, don't want to be sent to the slave labor camps of the Siberian Gulag. So there's three Putin apologists running in the presidential election. And if, if they hand the White House back to Trump, Trump says he wants to do away with NATO, which means that uh, Putin will have his way in Ukraine. And then what do you think will happen next? Three million people in Lithuania, that'd be next. So that's, that's all. Don't, well, I'm not telling you how to vote, but I'm just telling you if you, uh, if you vote for those three, Colonel West, Jill Stein, Robert Kennedy Jr., if you vote for those three, you're going to take votes away from Joe Biden. So, so yeah, you get it back to him. I think we're done. Oh. Right? Okay, so is, it, is that it? Word. Is that all the rebuttals, you Mike? The, you get you the, the last word, they say. Yeah. Um, okay, that was great. Cop City, I think that's a tremendous uh, parallel. Thank you. Um, that's, you know, Obviously, Lithuanians have experienced state violence in the past. Yeah. Um, For both sides, Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. But I mean, currently in Lithuania, I mean, the, the type of state violence that we accept here on a daily basis doesn't happen there today, right? From their own police and things like that. So, I mean, we have situations here. We have police kill people. A thousand people a year are killed by police in this country. More or less, a uh, thousand to 1,200 on average every year. Um, so yeah, I mean, the protests that I described were not, they're not ended any violence or anybody being killed, thank God. But um, but I think, yeah, the cop city protests and some of the things like, uh, I don't know the name of the, yeah. <laughs> I think those are actually excellent local examples. And if you look around, so I work in Detroit and you see examples all over Detroit too, people doing, often it's at the very local level doing all kinds of creative, innovative things to both build up their communities and also to get the attention of their government or to resist their government. So I'm always interested in examples of that. This to me was a beautiful one for, from a, another part of the world, but yeah, we have our own examples and I think they have a lot to learn from each other. And so that's, I'm a sociologist. So that's one of the things I'm interested in. Uh, what else? I mean, I, I agree with you, you know, the Putin apologists in the, yeah, I mean, that's, <clears throat> And, and they, they, they keep saying I mean, especially in the so you know the party of Reagan, so called. You know, um, there's a forest. There's a you know a lot of things named after Ronald Reagan in Poland and in Lithuania. I don't know if there's anything named after. Him. Probably is, but they would change his name to Ronaldus Reaganis because they change everything to a Lithuanian style name. But um, they are you know there there's this you know fondness in some cases for that that party that fought and was firm in fighting against resisting the Soviet domination of the Soviet Union and playing a role in the fall of the Soviet Union, at least in, not everybody agrees that they were responsible for it, but or Reagan in particular. But yeah, so it's it's um, strange to me that this party has become under, you know, the party of Trump. It's, uh, and people there just, they don't understand it. Like, <laughs> what is up in the, because, what happens here, I guess this even goes back to the Domkus example. I mean, what, what happens here matters to everybody. Everybody's affected by it. And when they see like politics, like going off the rails like that here, I mean, it's the damage can extend all over the world, right? Um, and I think everybody was, regardless of what you think of Joe Biden, there was a sense of relief everywhere that um, the other guy was no longer the president. Because at least it's... Dang. <laughs> some kind of stability that predictability you know but um anyway so what were some of the other things that were said so i would echo that point um oh kaliningrad okay so um i want my daughter to say something about kaliningrad come here tell about your experience with kaliningrad you don't want to yeah come on let's let's hear it and, and then the camera, come on, you think you can tell us. So um, I, at one point, it was April that we went, right? Uh -huh. It was at the very end of my dad's trip to um, Lithuania when we went to go visit him in Lithuania and we stayed for around 10 days. And um, for a little bit of that time, we went down to a place called the Coronian Spit, which is um, Kaliningrad, that is, that's what it is. And it connects to a part of Russia that is covered in sand dunes. And 
Um, we stayed in this little town called Nitta, and it was one of the most beautiful places that I've ever, I've ever been to in my life. And there was no, obviously not all of Russia is violent, right? Because this was an area where it was not populated at all. There weren't houses, nobody was living there. And it, it was probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to in my life. I loved it. So, yeah. We, we actually weren't in Russia, remember? We could see the border of Russia. So the Coronian Spit is this long peninsula, skinny, skinny peninsula that uh, that connects. Part of it is Lithuania, part of it is in Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is a section of Russia that's between um, Poland and uh, Lithuania. And the story of Kaliningrad that you asked about is that after World War II, for somebody had mentioned, oh, I want to say something about Darius and Doranus in, in the, the plane. I didn't mention the name of the plane. Does anybody know the name of the plane? Oh, I used to know. Well, it's, it'll be so obvious when I tell you. It was the Lituanica. It was the yes, Lituanica. Yeah, was right. And it crashed. Of course, and there are a lot of theories as to what actually happened. Was it shot down and so on? Because that 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 area at that time was controlled by the Germans. Uh, Gdansk, Danzig was a German city, uh, which is now part of Poland. So after World War II, I think, you can all look this up, of course, that you know the Soviets came through and... Uh, fighting the Germans all along the coast through Latvia, Lithuania, what's now Lithuania. And uh, Konigsberg was a German city. It was actually a great, uh, it was a free German city like Danzig had been. It was, uh, that was where Immanuel Kant was from. It was one of the oldest universities in, in Europe was in Konigsberg. They came through and they killed, they killed German, they, any German they found. They were, the Germans were fleeing, they were fleeing across the ice. They were fleeing, um, you know, to get away, to go to the mainland of Germany where they wouldn't be killed by the Soviets coming in. And so the Soviets took that area. And then, of course, after the war, when the um, allies, they were one of the allies, remember? Soviet Union, U.S., uh, Great Britain, they divided it up. And that's when, you know, Lithuania and uh, the Latvian states became a part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union also claimed this peace of uh, Kaliningrad, and then I think after the fall of the Soviet Union, the, the Soviets just, um, Russia just needed, this is a very important place for them, Kaliningrad, because it's on the Baltic coast, but the major, major port, shipping port. So I think they just were not gonna let it go. So I think the Lithuanians just, you know, couldn't fight that battle. They had to, they, so it remained in Russian hands and still is in Russian hands. But also, for those of you that know anything about amber, I'm wearing, this is black Polish amber here. Um, the, the, the biggest source of amber in the world, Baltic amber in the world, is actually in Kaliningrad. But um, so that's just a little bit about Kaliningrad. But you can go to this place where we went, near a beautiful town, a beach town, there's a lot of artists there and so on. It's a vacation yeah. resort. And you can climb up on the dunes and you can look and you can see in the distance the border. And there's a little outpost there, and I've been told if you, you know if you wander too far, they might shoot you. Yeah. And there, I, we did see when we were there, didn't we see an exchange of prisoners too? Yeah, our friend Pavel, who was with us, saw a, a kind of a some prisoners. People have been caught from one side being brought to the other side. I can't remember what the story was, but the more important thing is we did a cold plunge there. That was really good. We did a cold plunge together, and it was cold. But yeah, beautiful place, the Cronian Spit, very good chance to do that. Jean Paul Sartre was there once, and there's they put a statue of Jean Paul Sartre in the sand dunes. You have to go and find it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I think that's my rebuttal to your rebuttal. That's my last word. I appreciate you. Go ahead. And uh, here's, a, here's a book of Lithuanian words. If anybody wants to look at them? And uh, thank you. And thanks a lot. All right, the Ecology of Complexes is officially adjourned. I'm going to stop the recording.